Okay, good morning everyone. Um, today we're having two presentations from our PhD students. Rafa's gonna start and then Miguel's coming. Um, I'll give them each 20 to 25 minutes and we'll have a round of questions, comments, or suggestions for their thesis after that, both of them together. Uh, I'd like to remember you to keep your comments and suggestions constructive. After all, that's the, <laughs> the aim of it. Okay, um, so we'll start, we're starting with Rafa. Rafa is in the Ivan's group. His supervisors are Ivan and Chris, who's sitting there. He's been in the group for three years, working on phenotypic plasticity, right, <laughs> of his tadpoles. So, Rafa, thank you, and 20 minutes for you. Thanks, Ria. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, well, today I'm here to present the dissertation plan for my PhD with the title Evolutionary Divergence in Developmental Rate Across Pelobates Cultivars Populations. Uh, first, I would like to introduce my advisors, Ivan Gomez Mestre and Christoph Litke from, from home, from EBD, and also the, my academic tutor, uh, Laura Serrano from uh, University of Sevilla. Uh, also point out that uh, this PhD is founded by the Junta de Andalucía. Uh, now, uh, I will describe the conceptual framework of the dissertation, starting with this sentence. Uh, the survival and reproductive success of an organism uh, depend on the match between its phenotype and the environment that it experiences. Uh, that may uh, sound a bit uh, obvious, but it has a lot of uh, important connotation. For example, the how phenotypes are generated. Uh, our traditional evolutionary thinking uh, has been based on the concept uh, on the concept of a more or less rigid uh, relation between genotype and phenotype, considering the environment just as a filter that dictates uh, which uh, individuals survive and increasing their uh, the <coughs> The genetic, uh, their genetic, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, the genomic, um, well, increasing their genomic uh, ratio in the populations, sorry, uh, and that depends on the environment. Uh, however, nowadays we know that uh, the most organisms are able to respond to. Uh, environmental changes by uh, altering their phenotype, changing their their behavior, their <coughs> uh, their physiology, their morphology, life history traits, uh, doing that by altering their gene expression. Uh, so that can happen that we have uh, the same uh, the same genotype can produce uh, different phenotypes depending on the environment. By the way, I would like to introduce the concept of reaction norms. That is a good way to represent this relation between environment and phenotype. <coughs> uh, the main ingredients of phenotypic plasticity uh, are uh, environmental heterogeneity, that usually entails uh, varying selection pressures and also the availability of environmental cues that allows uh, uh, organisms to assess the environmental condition and produce the proper phenotype. Uh, studying plasticity is important because it allows uh, to increase the cryptic genetic variation in populations by giving, similars, uh, giving similar fitness to different genotypes. That's a uh, key survival mechanisms for at the individual and population levels when facing uh, fast uh, env environmental changes like global change. Uh, it can also help uh, organisms to explore new environments and it has been suggested as as a source of evolutionary innovations. 
uh, genetic accommodation is a concept uh, quite related with uh, plasticity. Uh, uh, it can happen that uh, a plastic uh, phenotypic trait uh, that is induced by the environmental conditions in a scenario with uh, reduced environmental heterogeneity uh, can lose this sensitivity to the, to the environment and become uh, a, a trait uh, controlled by genetic factors. Uh, this genetic accommodation can, can promote trait diversific diversification and speciation. Now, uh, going into our playground, <laughs> uh, amphibians are a perfect model for studying the intersection between ecology, evolution and development. Mainly because they are really sensitive to different environmental conditions, they can display a wide range of plastic uh, response to these uh, factors and they have a modular development. Uh, <coughs> especially they are able to decouple the growth from uh, the differentiation which allows them to, <coughs> to delay or, or accelerate their development and maybe uh, uh, arrive to metamorphosis uh, later or sooner, depending on the environmental conditions. <coughs> Our group uh, is focused mainly on spade food toads that um, have a, uh, which are really interesting because they have evolved at uh, widely divergent developmental rates and also mm, different degrees of sensitivity to the environment. Uh, on the one hand, we have the local Pelobates cultripes, uh, which uh, usually breeds in long-lasting ponds, uh, have a long, <coughs> a long larval period. It attains a really big size at the end of metamorphosis, but at the same time, is able to accelerate uh, development when they, they detect pond drying. On the other side, we have Spea and Scaphiopus. They are American species of spade foot toads that has, have evolved a uh, derived um, a short larval period and also a uh, small uh, larval size. Uh, this is considered a good example of phenotypic plasticity. Uh, the, the response in Pelobata sculptripes to pond drying is controlled by increasing levels of thyroid hormones, corticosterone and thyroid hormone receptors. Uh, which actually are uh, constitutively higher in Spea and Scaphiopus. Uh, another interesting point is that uh, the difference in morphology across species, uh, which are uh, shorter snouts and shorter uh, uh, hind limbs in fast developer species, in Spea and Scaphiopus, uh, are also found in, <coughs> in pelobates that accelerated the development during, during metamorphosis. Uh, and another important point is uh, the genome size, <coughs> uh, which is tightly related to the developmental rate. Uh, Scaphiopus cauti uh, genome is uh, a third of the size of pelobates genome. So that can be also a mechanism to accelerate uh, uh, development. Now we are arriving to the climax of this story. Previous work done by Henji Lee, sorry, uh, studying different populations in <coughs> central and southern Spain, uh, population of uh, Pelobates cultripes, uh, found uh, interesting, in interesting results. Uh, she found that a uh, different population has a different uh, developmental rate with the central 
Spain having faster um, developmental rate, but uh, at the same time they weren't able uh, to accelerate development in response to, to water level reduction, while the southern, the southern uh, populations were able to do it. Um, that was really correlated with the environmental condition and mainly the heterogeneity in, <coughs> in hydro period of those ponds. Uh, maybe that sounds familiar because it's really similar to what happened with the uh, uh, Scafiopus, Spea and Pelobates, but uh, at the population levels. So we think that this is a wonderful setup to try to study how genetic accommodation starts. Um, having all that in mind, I present these objectives, these aims for my PhD that will be understand how environmental factors influence developmental acceleration response in Pilobates cultripes, uh, assess variation in the level of developmental plasticity across populations, characterize bioclimatic regions within the distribution of the species, and identify genetic variation associated with the observed adaptive divergence. <coughs> um, well, this is how we are planning to do all that. Uh, uh, the first step uh, has been study in more detail one of the keystones of the adaptive plasticity, which is the, uh, the availability of reliable cues for uh, assess the environment. Uh, we know that Pelobates is able to, is able to accelerate in response to pond drying. Uh, but pond drying is a complex process that englobes different factors, as can be uh, a reduction in pond volume and area, increased uh, temperature and solute concentrations. Uh, also, we can find a decrease in the available resources, and that may imply higher competition and probably many other factors. Uh, but the thing is, the fact is that we didn't know exactly which of those cues are used by Pelobates to detect uh, pond drying and induce developmental acceleration. Uh, we also want to know how uh, do tadpole respond to these cues and what consequences does the, this response, the acceleration, uh, has on tadpoles. Uh, to find these answers, we already run an experiment in which we play a bit with uh, different uh, aquaria setups, uh, <coughs> trying to decompose the and isolate different uh, pond drying cues, uh, pond drying uh, factors uh <coughs> that were the, uh, that we represent in the following treatments. Uh, we started with just keeping the the same conditions, the high water condition during all the larval period. Uh, we also did some, <coughs> in some cases, the uh, water drop, uh, a drop in the water level, uh, leaving only nine centimeters of water. And we, uh, we did that in, in both ways, uh, in a sudden way, and also in a gradual way uh, during uh, 21 days, 21 days. Uh, we also have a treatment with uh, horizontal aquaria in which we have the same volume that in the high water treatment, but with the water depth of the water drop treatments. <coughs> Another factor that we wanted to manipulate was temperature. Uh, we use heaters to increase the temperature in the, in the aquaria from 20 degrees to 28 degrees. And we also did it in both ways, in a fast way and also in a gradual way during also 21 days. <coughs> uh, we also try to simulate competition by placing uh, mirrors in the, uh, in the laterals of some aquaria. And uh, le <coughs> the reduction in resources, uh, decreasing the amount of food that we give to the tadpoles. <coughs> So, uh, how respond the tadpole to these uh, uh, treatments? 
we measured the larval period and we found that the most significant response were to water, to increase temperature in water and to the decreased water level, as we see here. Uh, they produce a similar acceleration in the development. Uh, we also find out that uh, <coughs> uh, Tadpole needs to perceive uh, an actual reduction in water level as <coughs> individuals that we kept at uh, constant low water level in the horizontal tank didn't accelerate. <coughs> uh, for we also wonder if what were the, the mechanisms underlying this response to, uh, to temperature and also to water level decrease, uh, as well as the consequence that's, that this acceleration imply. imply. <coughs> For that, uh, we record uh, the weight of metamorphosis, fat body weight, uh, morphometric measurements, and also we study different effects on tissues. We are starting to analyze all that, all this data, and the first results uh, are mm, really interesting, as they suggest that we, uh, there can be potential differences between temperature and water level responses. Uh, it seems that the uh, response to water level is energetic, energetically more demanding than the response to temperature, as we can see here. The fat proportion is a uh, indicative of the um, energ energetic reserve that the metamorph had. <coughs> well, uh, let's go with the main part of the dissertation. Uh, we will try to character characterize the bioclimatic regions within the distribution of Pelobates cultripes. In order to do that, we are combining uh, information from, from GBIF about uh, site sightings of Pelobates and also climatic data from work line. We have already done a preliminary uh, analysis, uh, multivariate analysis, uh, in which we have mm, determined 12 different bioclimatic cluster or regions across the distribution of Pelobates. Uh, these regions uh, have similar um, conditions, um, environmental conditions in terms of precipitation, temperature, uh, and <coughs> And, the, and we have used this first mainly for design the <coughs> uh, the sampling the field sampling strategy that we will follow in the next part of the work in, of the dissertation. But also we want to do more analysis to try to understand how uh, to try to describe the. <coughs> I will say, the heterogeneity in, the, in those uh, environmental conditions. Furthermore, we want to uh, describe the, the environmental heterogeneity in either period of the breeding site that we will sample in, in, this, uh, in this thesis. For that, we want to use historical climatic data and the satellite images from Landsat and Sentinel for the last 35 years. Uh, we count for that with the support of LAST. Uh, the next step will be the characterization of those developmental, uh, the developmental plasticity across population, also the, the, the standard developmental rate. Uh, for, do, for, for that, we want to, to conduct an extensive uh, common garden experiment. Uh, we have already found potential breeding place uh, sites uh, across the different bioclimatic regions. And we, <coughs> we will uh, sample three different uh, populations in each uh, climatic region. From each uh, population, we will take a portion of two clutches and grow uh, 14 tadpoles of each clutch, a total amount of 
20 of 28 tadpoles per population. Uh, once they, they reach a, a particular developmental stage, uh, we will expose uh, the half of the tadpoles to reduce water level. Um, with that experiment, we, we will determine the developmental rate and the developmental plasticity degree. Uh, we expect to find uh, different uh, differences in the standard developmental rate as we expect that some population will be constitutively uh, faster or will have a longer larval period and also differences in plasticity, I mean, uh, the response to, <coughs> to pond drawing. Uh, um, we want to correlate this information with the previous uh, results of the bioclimatic analysis. Uh, another part of this experiment will be co uh, collect data about body mass, morphometric measurement and metabolic rate as we did before with the <coughs> multiple Q experiment. Uh, to cap it all to <laughs> Like the final step will be to look for genetic differences associated to adaptive divergence in development. Uh, we will start by uh, having blood smears from the tadpoles the, from the common garden experiment for estimating the genome size. <coughs> uh, we didn't expect to find uh, huge differences in genome size, but we think that uh, <coughs> check it, um, may be worth it. The more interesting part, we think, will be to perform a low coverage world genome sequencing of individuals from all the populations. Uh, a good starting point is that we count with a good quality reference genome. <coughs> and we are planning to uh, sequence 15 individuals per population, combining the uh, individuals from the common garden experiment and also uh, collecting animals during the field sampling. Uh, we want to do a, a sequence to sequence the, their genome at uh, one or two X coverage. Um, after that, we will perform uh, genome-wide uh, scans uh, looking for uh, variation in SNPs, in copy number variants, insertion, deletions, uh, maybe also transposable elements uh, that mm, will uh, show some signature, signatures of uh, selection across mm, populations. Trying to sum up a bit all that, uh, those are the expected chapters of this dissertation. The first one, triggers of developmental acceleration, will be basically the, the first objective, the multiple Q experiment. Variation in phenotypic plasticity level across bioclimatic regions uh, will be a combination of, as I said before, the, uh, <coughs> the results from the common garden experiments and the bioclimatic uh, analysis combining uh, the developmental rate uh, information and the heterogeneity as we expect that uh, population exposed to higher heterogeneity will, will show a higher phenotypic plasticity and population with lower heterogeneity uh, will have a more uh, canalized uh, development. In genomic region associate, uh, associated with adaptive divergence in developmental rate, we'll, we'll uh, describe the, what we find in the world genome sequencing. And finally, consequence of phenotypic plasticity and genetic accommodation of developmental uh, acceleration, we'll, we'll try to study the, all the information about the consequence in in size, in, in metabolic rate, and all this information that we will collect during the experiments, and see how it's correlated with the hypothesis of genetic accommodation that we have seen with the, at the interspecific level. But yeah, 
a, a population level, in population level. Uh, well, finally, I will point out that the funding of this PhD includes some budget to do research stays, stays. Uh, we are thinking to do that I should do a long-term stay in a genomic group where I can get some skills for the genomic analysis and also a short stay in an amphibian endocrinology group as we, are, we have contact with some colleagues that are Erika Crispy and Daniel Buchholz. Finally, some knowledge, <laughs> thanks to the Coevo Devo group, uh, to all the VD colleagues that always are supporting me, the lab technicians that always are willing to teach techniques and give a hand if necessary, in, if necessary. Uh, to the last lab, also the Lynx Genomic Group, because of his advice in the genomic uh, objective. And well, so, Fundando Lucia. That's it. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. You. Rafa, that was very interesting. Um, we'll, we'll go straight to Miguel. Miguel, <laughs> please. <laughs> um, yeah, and then we can have time for questions for both of them, okay? Um, okay, so Miguel, you know that usually people come to make their thesis at the EBD and they've never been to Doñana and they kind of get to know Doñana after they start their projects. Well, Miguel has a different story. Apparently he kind of grew up in the Marismas <laughs> and then <laughs> he came and then he came to develop his thesis. So he's under the supervision of Polly and well, did you, did you find it? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, well, he told me that he's been going to the Doñana Park and to the Marisma since he was 12. So he knows the area very well. He also mm -hmm. knows the problems mm -hmm. of the area very uh -huh. well. And I think he lost his presentation. Pero que no se reproduce, ¿no? Great. <laughs> um, yeah, so his thesis goes about the park and I'll let you know <coughs> when you have 20 minutes, okay? Okay. Look at me. So, <laughs> good afternoon. Uh, so, and thanks for being here, especially if you were also around yesterday because I'm going to repeat part of it. Uh, I'm Miguel. I'm an FPI, I have a whole of FPI contract since a year ago that I started here at EBD. Uh, this FPI, FPI grant is associated to a national plan that Poly Hall that has a title, as you can see, for my presentation. And I'm being supervised at the, well, two tries at the University of Sevilla by Juan Francisco Beltran. Uh, I'm going to skip uh, the introduction mostly, because we all know that wetlands are quite endangered worldwide with loss rates three times faster than forests, and they're very important not only for uh, ecosystem services, but all also in terms of biodiversity. So moving to Doñana, Doñana is not any wetland, but uh, arguably the most important wetland in Europe, holding astonishing numbers of, well, being traditionally very well known for its marshes. It's more than 27,000 hectares of marshes that hold astonishing numbers of wintering and breeding and breeding water birds. But I want to talk about another hidden wetland that lies on top of the sandy areas of the National Park. And this is a, a network of more than 3,000 Mediterranean temporary ponds. These ponds are highly abundant, heterogeneous, ranging from a few permanent ponds to a lot of ephemeral ones and are highly interconnected, being those key features for the high biodiversity held by the system with more than 600 different taxa and being priority habitats by in the European Union. But it's very easy to realize that something is very wrong in Doñana, especially in the Doñana ponds. The problem is that Doñana lies on top of an aquifer five times larger than the area of the National Park and there are two main activities that have developed on top of this aquifer. 
One is the touristic resort of Mata Las Cañas that experienced a, a very fast uh, development during the 70s and used water abstractions, groundwater abstractions for human supply and greenhouse farming, mainly for red berries that yeah, in, uh, experienced a five-fold increase in the last 20 years. <coughs> then there are, in, since 1989, there are more than 20 scientific publications and expert reports warning about the threat that these abstractions could pose to the system, to the conservation of Doñana. But these works have been always limited by the small subset of, of ponds studied, by the, because they only studied one threat at a time, or because they ignored surface water and, fo and focused only on uh, the depth of the water table. This is the reason why Ramsar and other European scientists, when they came to Doñana in advisory mission, missions in 2020 and even this year, they say that there is no documented evidence of a uh, detrimental effect of water abstractions on Doñanas. And this is why this project was born, to try to study the trends, the desiccation trends that Doñana is ex experiencing, focusing mainly on the pond network, and how these trends are affecting Doñana's biodiversity, wetland biodiversity. And we have divided the, my PhD dissertation in four main chapters. The first two of them would be devoted to will address changes in the quantity and quality of the water of the ponds, while the other two of them will focus on uh, defects on biodiversity. Going to chapter one, uh, we wanted to address three main questions. One was to quantify if indeed there are trends in the pond network. Then, to determine what are the differential effects of anthropic and climatic factors on the pond network and try to make an assessment of the conservation of these ponds. <coughs> so for the first objective, of course, we have to go to the last, that I think is the best lab here at DVD right now because everyone grades them, grades them. And we got to work with these uh, Landsat flood masks. And when we cross this flood mask with cartographies of the Doñana Pond Network made in 2003, we are, we are able to extract two different variables of interest for every pond and year. One would be the date of desiccation and the other the maximum flooded area. So having these variables, we can start to play and see that, for example, uh, from all the ponds that Landsat can detect, that are around 316, 60% of them have been, can be now considered dry. Uh, they have didn't flood since at, le since at least uh, 2013. And that ponds of all different ideological categories are experiencing declines in either their desiccation date or maximum flooded area. Then we can move to objective number two and try to disentangle the drivers of these trends. So we built different nested uh, GAMs ranging from null models to climatic models and those with diff uh, using the, either the activity, well, well, the activity of the touristic resort or greenhouse cover to a full model that included everything. And in all cases, in both response variables, full models were always the best. Of course, as we would all, all expect, climate plays a very important role in the Ñana because the recharge of the aquifer and therefore the flooding of the ponds depend on annual rainfall, but also that, for example, Matalascaña, the area covered by Matalascañas has a negative effect, significant, significant negative effect on pond date of the, uh, day of desiccation. And this effect is stronger the closer the ponds are to Matalascañas. Also, the greenhouses have a huge impact in ponds. In the case of the date of desiccation, only the Northern National Park seems to have a significant negative effects. But in terms of maximum flooded area, ponds all over Doñana are being affected by greenhouses. And then when we move to objective number three, uh, we used a climatic model, a model that considered only these climatic variables. And for each pond, we extracted the residuals and tested the presence and magnitude of trends in these residuals in a way that these trends would mean that ponds are flooding more or less than what is expected by climate. And when you make an interpolation on a map of Doñana, what you find is that there are ubiquitously negative trends all over the national park, never mind how far you are from the anthropic stressors. Of course, you can also see some very few 
around three or four bonds in the northern area of the park that show positive trends. But this is attributable to uh, a clearing of eucalyptus tree plantations done in 2005 and also artificial ponds that now uh, gather excess water from greenhouses. So we can say that the dynamics of the ponds there have been quite altered in the last decade. With this, we can move to the, well, I didn't say that this first chapter, as you can see, is in preparation already to be submitted. And now we can move to the second chapter of my, of my dissertation, that would be to assess the historical changes in water quality. There are evidences from uh, studies here from the house for Irene Paredes that some areas of the marshes are suffering from eutrophization, eutrophication. And the origin of this eutrophication is clearly anthropic. <clears throat> so we wonder what is going on with the Doñana ponds and what was, has happened through time. Our hypothesis is that even if Doñana has no streams coming, from, uh, well, the ponds have no ent direct entrance from streams coming from greenhouses or ur urban areas, declines in the number and size of the ponds would mean also that cattle is exer exerting a higher pressure, pressure on the remnant ponds. And then we think that that can be, can be, could be one of the reasons why we are seeing such levels of eutrophication in ponds lately. So uh, our objective was to use her all herbaria specimens taken since the 80s till now uh, and, sta and use stable isotopes to try to see these changes, historical changes in the pond network. This would be together with the uh, Stable Isotope Laboratory with the University of Cartagena and we'll, we would try to get a PhD stay in the International Atomic Energy in agency in Austria. Uh, for this objective, we have three main, two main sampling periods through history, one in the 80s, another one at the beginning of the 2000s, even some ponds have been sampling, sampled during the 90s, and we plan to repeat these, sample, these samplings in this next year, because this last year was horrible in terms of water and pond availability. So when looking to the herbaria, we found that the three plant, aquatic plant species have been repeatedly sampled through time in seven ponds. And we want first to take a gradient of ponds with different hydropyridians, different gradient, uh, a gradient of nutrients, and sample these aquatic plants and another common aquatic plant to study the, their isotopic signatures, but also take water samples to kind of interpret what we are seeing in the isotopes and sample this pond throughout the year because ponds vary a lot since the time of the flooding to the drying period in summer. And use this information to kind of interpret the, uh, the results we, we will get from the herbaria specimens to reconstruct how pond quality could be in the past, pond, pond water quality. Uh, then we would move to the third chapter of my PhD that would, would be is the first one regarding biologic uh, animal communities. And we know that there are two main groups of animals that could suffer from these declines in the Doñana Pond network. First one would be those animals that uh, need longer hydro periods because with this reduction they, w they won't have their niche. And the other would be species that even if they, didn't, they don't need such longer hydro periods, they have a low dispersal cap capability. And this would be the case, for example, of amphibian and dragonfly larvae. In case of uh, turtles, aquatic turtles, we have two native species here in Spain and in Doñana. And we want to address two main objectives. The changes in their distribution in Doñana and the drivers of these changes, and the other would be changes in population structure and dynamics. The way to do it is, well, we're very lucky that Doñana has been intensively sampled in the past. For example, in, for the terrapins, uh, there is a PhD dissertation that uh, uh, occurred in Doñana in the first half of the 90s. They did capture recapture of the individuals, so they were individually marked. And they studied their habitat characteristics, uh, abundance, population structure, reproduction. <coughs> and then since the 97 till the beginning of the 2000s, these samples were continued to make distribution maps. 
we have been repeating all these samplings and uh, fast snap well, well and this sample, uh, these samplings are done in this way we go to all ponds we can find in Doñana but prioritizing those that were sampled in the past uh, we place these funeral traps uh, in the afternoon during the morning we retrieve them and take the, the turtles and individually, individually tag them and also take some physical chemical parameters of the ponds uh, and this is a quick snapshot of the result of the sampling we've been doing in the last couple of years but for Emis orbicularis that as you can see is a species that used to be pretty well distributed all over Doñana even in the inner areas of the park uh, has, lot, uh, has lost a lot of its distribution. If you remember the map of the flooding anomalies, these inner areas of the park are also, one of the, uh, are also the areas that are most affected by abstractions. <coughs> and then we can use all these physical chemical parameters to study why in some ponds, even if there is still water, we have witnessed changes in the species that are present now, present now compared to the 90s, for example, the case of Santa Olalla that has lost the presence of Emis orbicularis even in years where they sti it still got water. Regarding the second objective, as we have been doing repeatedly uh, capture recapture, we can now uh, use this methodology to study population size back and then, there's its structure, changes in recruitment, survival, or even movement, and compare the two periods to see how everything has changed. And now we will move to the groups of animals that, that need water to complete their life cycles and have a dispersal, uh, uh, a limited dispersal capability. Uh, these two groups of species are really interesting because they have both different requirements on, in terms of Every species has different requirements in terms of water quantity uh, and duration. So the annual assemblages you see in the field reflect different habitat availability that you have in that certain year. So for the case of dragonflies, there have been several expeditions in the 1956 with the Doña expedition that have been sampling dragonflies here. So we have records of the species that were present and how they have changed through time and observe, um, observe a general decline in the number of species that we are uh, counting every year. But Polly also since 2011 started doing monthly transects in a fixed number of ponds, ponds with different hydro periods and this allowed us to have a finer comparison through time, through time so we can compare how change uh, year to year uh, change in conditions of these ponds are determining the assemblages you find but also how they change throughout the season. For example, years like this, some species had emergence time quite uh, delayed compared to better years. <coughs> and for the amphibians, we want to do something very similar than for the dragonflies but, you know, as always in ecology, you don't work with what you would like to but with what we have. So our sampling periods are quite more reduced. We're comparing two periods, the first half of the 2000s with actual periods. And in total right now we have sampled around 80 ponds that were also sampled in the beginning of 2000. There were more than 200 ponds sampled. And for all these ponds we want to compare the number uh, changes in the distribution and, how, and the species assemblages and both the park and the, and the individual pond level. What you see in the graphs is that even with those, if this data is not updated to 2022 samplings, uh, there are a lot of species that have, that has lost a lot of this, their distribution. And also the ponds used to be much more richer in terms of species present than what we are finding right now. So we are sure that we'll find quite interesting results here. Then we will move to the last chapter of my dissertation. That is a question that we get asked a lot recently, especially in the media. That is if everything that we are telling about how Doñana is being destroyed has a solution. It is a way back to restore this. So 
we're work, working on temporary ponds that are used to, uh, to a period of the year that they are dry. But some of these ponds have completely disappeared. For example, this Brecillo pond that is now completely covered on, with terrestrial vegetation. We have gradients of ponds that we have quantified in chapter one from ponds that have been extinct since more than, uh, have disappeared for more than two, 10 years ago to ones that are only degraded but still flooding every year to ponds that are quite good. So having this gradient, we have visited a lot of ponds for every category and we have been sampling the sediment, taking sediment samples and we're bringing now here to, the, to EBD, to the climatic chambers, and we are gonna flood them and let's see if these extinct ponds have still the potential to restore the aquatic communities that they had in the past. And I don't have an acknowledgement slide, but I wanted to acknowledge, for obviously, all the group, not only Polly and the group of the pond team, but also Ivan, the Eco Ibo Devo group, and my partners of the, of the office for, for their help. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Miguel. And we have time for questions now, so whoever wanna go first. So, um, Rafa, so I asked about this yesterday, but it does seem to me important if i i always think about the clearest effect of uh, lowering water levels is really peak temperatures so it's you know that the, the maximum temperature water temperature increases very quickly as the water level goes down so if you really do these common garden experiments in fixed temperatures it seems to me that you're missing a key uh, indicator of, of declining water levels that would be simulated if you change the temperature from nighttime and daytime as we are doing right now to germinate the seeds that we're extracting from waterfowl feces. We're putting them on higher temperature during the day or during light and lower temperature when it's dark. So what do you think about that? I mean, I, for me, it would be like one of the first things I would think about including in your design. Yeah, I think it's a nice suggestion. Well, we have seen that uh, probably the mechanisms to respond to both factors, to pond drying and temperature, probably are different. Uh, and yeah, maybe it would be a good idea to include them. Also, everything can become a bit more complex, but yeah, we can think about it as we are ready to start all the field sampling, and we will consider it. Thank you. <coughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's a follow-up of the of the Andy in some way. Well, I, I think uh, uh, I think uh, there is a uh, apparent discrepancy between the 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 pattern you want to discover of plasticity across the bio bioclimatic areas. It's not. Uh, I don't see very well the connection with the experimental driver mechanism that you want to test. Because I don't know if you have information of the pony or period, the mean and variability across these biogeographic uh, places. Uh, yeah, you know, well, location. that's a big part of what we want to do. Uh, mm, we are planning to, to try to analyze these variants, these uh, historical variants in hydro period. Uh, from the ponds that we are planning to collect uh, tadpoles and correlate that with the, yeah, with the mm, standard developmental rate and the plasticity uh, degree that they can show. No. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, a, it's a very complex uh, question in a yeah, way because, uh, we know. for instance, as uh, Miguel has, has examined the, the pond duration, Euro period, maybe variable for many reasons, for the rainfall, temperature, 
uh, soils and many, many, many factors, yeah. the depth of the ponds, many, many things. Huh? So one possibility also, <coughs> uh, yeah, connecting with the question made by Andy, is to, if it would be better to, to link uh, the bioclimatic uh, areas you want to test with the thermal sensitivity, because probably temperature is more variable or is more, there is a more signal in, in temperature variation, uh, and then the possibility of plasticity <coughs> to the thermal, the thermal sensitivity, analyzing the reaction north of two temperature, for instance, in this gradient of bioclimatic. But this, anyway, it's too much work. Yeah. <laughs> it's too much work. You, you know have so that, that would uh, be yeah, it's very possible. intensely. <laughs> I don't know, you have At least for sure it's impossible to cross supervisor both. have to, to select uh, yeah. perfectly the, the we experiments. We have seen that maybe the stronger work. response is to water level decrease. So mm. if we have to choose some a cue, a factor that represents that, probably we will, we will go, f go for water level re reduction. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the comment. <coughs> This is for Miguel. Thanks for the nice presentation. And maybe it's a silly question, or <laughs> you cannot uh, answer it, but how can you um, measure the quality of the water using the isotopes uh, in the plants? Can you mm -hmm. just elaborate a little bit? Yeah. I'm curious. There is a very cool piece of work that was out, I think, a couple of years ago, that they found out that they can use the herbaria specimens of macroalgae to trace back a welling event in the Gulf of California. And uh, it completely matches with the periods of time where the fissure is crushed. So we're using the same principle in, term, in our case for aquatic plants. Uh, the carbon isotopes inform us about the degree of uh, hydric stress the plants are experiencing. The nitrogen by itself just tell us if the sources of nitrogen have changed, but if you use that together with the uh, amount, the bulk amount of phosphorus you find in the plant, tells you about eutrophication in the system. And if you use both isotopical signals of carbon and nitrogen, and you kind of get some samples from, let's say, industrial fertilizer, uh, cattle dung, uh, a fixed atmospherically fixed nitrogen, and you have it in your kind of PCA, you can extract the proportions of the nitrogen used from the plant that comes from every source. Super nice. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Yeah, thanks both. Uh, so I have a question for Miguel. Well, more of a, a comment, I guess. Uh, so uh, you started looking at the, the tortoise, no, turtle terrapin data. Right, um, mm -hmm. and I saw that you also have losses in ponds, where sort of in the previous chapter you've shown that those are ponds that have experienced increases in in water. Right. Mm -hmm. So have you looked at? I mean, you said you're also going to look at eutrophication levels and things like that. I mean, what what might explain the loss mm -hmm. there, even though you don't have a loss in the ponds? Yeah, the problem right? is that uh, we're talking about different resolutions because in the first chapter is the resolution is. Uh, ponds are uh, bigger than 900 square meters, there's a minimum resolution of Landsat, while when we're in the field, if we find a puddle that is the size of this room, we will sample it. But of course, Landsat is, gonna, is not going to detect it. So there are can some differences there. Yeah. So, so you, don't, you expect to find kind of a, a, a homogeneous loss in, in terrapins, even in the northern areas where you said generally there's more or water or well, for example, with Mauremis, what we're finding out is that the area of the Soto that was subject to this restoration, uh, you are colonizing the Sotos when, when it was not present 30 years ago, but it's because it now has water all year round, even if the, they are, it's super contaminated, but they are there, not in other areas of the park, but now they're also there. So we have to be cautious when we interpret all this in the light also of all the management that the area has suffered in the past. Because yeah, super interesting. Really complex, right? 
Hmm. Did, is there Chaquemes also in Doniana? Uh, it was supposed to be extinct, but this year in Marismillas they found one Chaquemis yeah. when they were cleaning one Zacayón. Okay. <laughs> and I guess there's some competition there be for resources between species or? I think that's for his work. <laughs> <laughs> Food. Yeah, I think what you have always said is that they compete for the basking places, trachemis yes. and the other one, but not for food. Well, if I have to, I can ask Rafa. Rafa. <laughs> Rafa. Uh, yeah, uh, the um, environmental heterogeneity you measure through the hydro period. We want to combine both uh, the hydro period uh, estimate that we are yes. still but working uh, on that and also the bioclimatic data from okay, World okay, Clean. Okay. We try okay. to combine both and maybe use other different uh, uh, proxies of yes, environmental heterogeneity. I, I was asking David because uh, uh, nice. you <laughs> told about measuring the hydro period with the 35 years of Landsat image. But, but uh, my, my, uh, my suggestion is that you can also use the the, the image of a single year a wide, uh, with a wide hydro period because you only want to take the like the snapshot of how the ponds <coughs> uh, are different, no? How Sorry? how different ponds uh, respond to the to the desiccation, to the to the to the climate uh, characteristics. So yeah. now that you have uh, a sentinel or Landsat image every week, more or less, you have a, a very very good uh, data for a single year instead of using so why the vari variability in how the or when the image were shot and so. I think and it is less work than analyzing hydro period in the last years. Nice. Can be a, <laughs> a good way to maybe <laughs> save some. Okay. Well, probably David <laughs> will have more to say. Because <laughs> <laughs> he's the, <laughs> the expert. Primero pedí perdón por yo hablar en español. Sí. Poli me estaba preguntando una serie de cosas que no termino de, de entender del todo. Eh, yo creo que tú estabas calculando el hidroperiodo con Google Earth Engine en las zonas de, de Madrid y en las zonas fuera de Doñana. Para Doñana sí tenemos una, eh, un cálculo de hidroperiodo muy bueno, que hay varios proyectos trabajando en él para sacar información sobre, sobre las lagunas, sobre la marisma y sobre zonas cercanas. A lo mejor nos están pidiendo ahora también datos de Lodiel. Y se puede hacer con Landsat, pero para otras regiones de España eh, no tenemos eso hecho. Entonces, para algunos proyectos lo que hemos estado intentando desarrollar eh, es un, una extracción de, de área inundada o de variables relacionadas con la área inundada, eh, píxel a píxel, eh, usando Google Earth Engine. Eh, empezamos con... Yuli, Yu. Shang Shangji, Shang eh, empezamos con ella a hacer cosas y yo creo que las variables de hidroperiodo de las lagunas fuera de Doñana las va a estimar eh, sacando datos tanto de la serie Landsat con Sentinel, eh, de toda la serie histórica. Eh, se puede basar en un año, puede tenerlos todos, eh, todos los datos extraídos. Y va a tener que ir píxel a píxel estimando el hidroperiodo de cada laguna. Muchas de sus lagunas son de muy pequeño tamaño y posiblemente además es un píxel en Landsat y 8 o 9 píxeles en Sentinel. Eh, pero bueno, intuyo que va a estar trabajando en eso. ¿Todavía no habéis terminado esa parte? No. <laughs> vale, que un desarrollo. We still have a lot of work to do in that part. But there, uh, we thought that we're interesting not try to characterize only the actual hydro period, but also the historical uh, variation in, in hydro period. Uh, well, historical since <coughs> uh, 1980 or something, <laughs> but yeah, thank you. <coughs> well,
Miguel, uh, so you didn't say much about what you think are the causes of losing species uh, over time, uh, particularly the amphibians and the reptiles, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering if you could tell us a bit more about that. I mean, there's so many possible factors, aren't there? Uh, Definitely. Cyanobacteria could be one. I mean, now mm -hmm. it's estimated that more elephants die in Botswana from cyanobacteria mm -hmm. poisoning than from poaching, for example. The thing is that we uh, have just begun. Salinity, um, high temperatures, peak temperatures in summer obviously have gone up. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what are you thinking is likely yeah, to be more important? For example, for the terrapins, we just had an, an epiphany this summer during field work. In, th in this moment, that we some water of Santa Olaya splashed in our mouth, and we realized that it was completely salty for us. And we know that, for example, one of the limiting factors that has been kind of suggested for the distribution of Emis orbicularis is salinity. Indeed, you don't find them in the marshes. That could be probably one of the reasons why it has disappeared from Santa Olalla. So now that we have, for example, during the 90s, also these physical chemical parameters were examined, and we have repeated in the same ponds, and we have repeated all of them in the same ponds, so we can now start to analyze how they have changed and how they affect them, but we can only get some insights of it. For example, for amphibians, I guess the, the arrival of the crayfish must have had a big impact on the amphibian larvae of the ponds. As we are sampling them, not only for amphibians, but also for zooplankton, for turtles, for aquatic vegetation, you have also all this information to have a bigger context of everything that has changed on those, on those ponds. And still, we're beginning to do the analysis there. What about the thermal ecology? I mean, is there enough information about these species to really know whether in these increasing heat waves we have, maybe mm -hmm. the, the lethal temperatures are already being exceeded in some cases? Uh, regarding amphibians, I have no clue if they could have been uh, exceeded. But for example, with turtles, what we find in the big, uh, in the big ponds is that they come to the sergeant areas of the aquifer. You see that the, all the southern areas of the ponds, you have a, a fresh water coming, fresh, uh, yeah, fresh, even sweet water coming from the aquifer. And you see that as soon as the condition on the ponds start to degrade, you find that all the terrapins are, hi are hiding there prior to probably escaping to estivate out of the water when the uh, pond completely dries out. So for pond, uh, for, and when we go there, uh, there is no one from work risk here. So when you, you go barefoot in these ponds, you completely realize that those sergeant areas are way colder than the surroundings of, of the pond. Like they could reach even 18 degrees. Last opportunity. No? OK. I think we're done. Thank you, guys, for your presentations. Thank and thank you for always being here. <laughs>